Erev Tov Ako. Good morning in Ottawa. Greetings from our friends around the United States, in Israel, and around the world. I'm already seeing greetings in our chat from as far as away as Saudi Arabia, our friend Carlo, Los Angeles, Montreal, Philadelphia, Toronto, San Diego, Upper West Side, Tallahassee, New York City, South Florida. We have folks from all over here for this important, important conversation with Ambassador Dennis Ross. We're in a period that is both a time of, of reflection for many uh, with the Abrahamic traditions celebrating three very important holidays. For all of you uh, who want to you know, participate and share your goodwill about this period, please put a little something in the chat, send some love, send a holiday greeting. Indeed, we could use just a bissel more of uh, uh, goodwill at the moment and a little bit of prayers for peace is not going to hurt anyone at this time. This has been a difficult, difficult, challenging period on the geopolitical front and we are really going to be uh, treated today with some incredible insights from Ambassador Ross uh, about both the Middle East region and the geopolitics of uh, the rest of the world at the moment. I'm so glad to be here uh, today with uh, Jeff Robbins, a partner at Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair, who's graciously partnering with us on this uh, episode today. Jeff's a longtime friend and colleague of Ambassador Ross. Uh, prior to his prior practice, he was a former assistant U.S. attorney uh, for the District of Massachusetts as well as a presidential appointee as a US delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Commission in Geneva. Jeff will bring us some opening greetings, then we'll hear from Ambassador Ross, and we've got a robust audience today with lots of questions. Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Wayne, very much. And let me just say simply and briefly how pleased we are to be collaborating with the venerable America-Israel Friendship League to present this program particularly this program, particularly at this time, and particularly with Ambassador Ross. As all of you know, since its foundation in, um, its founding in, in 1971 by American leaders from both political parties, the League has played a really important role in advancing the historic friendship and the partnership that exists between the United States and Israel, a friendship and a, a partnership founded and continually refreshed by a shared commitment to democracy, to humanitarian values, to diversity, and to tolerance. And it's a, re a relationship it's a, that confers immense benefits on the citizens of both countries, and frankly, beyond that. And finally, we could hardly be more fortunate uh, in having uh, our speaker, Ambassador Ross, who is, uh, fair to say, the gold standard of public service at a national level, and, and one of the most well-respected American diplomats of the past 35 years. As you will hear, or as you perhaps already know, he was a top advisor to one American president on the Soviet Union, a top advisor to a second American president on the Middle East, and a top advisor on uh, uh, Iran to a third American president. So it's hardly any wonder that the program has attracted so many registrants from around the world who look forward to hearing what he has to say, and I'm one of them. So once again, Saul Ewing is delighted to partner with the League on this pretty timely program. Uh, and many thanks, Wayne, to you and to your entire team. Thanks, Jeff. Ambassador Dennis Ross is well known as a seasoned diplomat. He's currently the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the prestigious Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's also a lecturer at Georgetown University Center for Jewish Civilization. You heard a little from Jeff about his service to uh, this country uh, over 12 years, uh, really leading role shaping in Middle East policy for the United States, for George H.W. Bush, for Bill Clinton, special assistant to President Obama at the National Security Council and special advisor to Senator, uh, at the time, Secretary Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, there are a lot of books behind Dennis Ross at, at the moment, maybe somewhere in there, maybe requiring a little dusting off would be the dissertation he wrote uh, years ago on Soviet decision making, which uh, who knows, 
um, maybe his next book or something, given how events are going. Ambassador Ross, it's great to have you uh, with us. We're so looking forward to your comments uh, about uh, the, the events of the world today and looking forward to uh, hearing your perspective and taking some questions after. Great, thank you, Wayne. Um, you know, I often say that when you're a specialist on somebody, when you're a specialist on a country that no longer exists, it says something about your age. But it turns out in the case of, of Putin that he's trying to make that, especially on the Soviet Union, quite relevant again. What I'd like to do is, is cover in a kind of overview fashion, three different sets of issues and, uh, and give a sense, a feeling, a perspective about how to think about all of them. It would be unnatural, strange, and, and also irrelevant if I wasn't gonna talk about Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it preoccupies all of us for very good reason right now. And what I want to try to put it in a, in a frame in terms of A, uh, in a sense, what we, what we can learn from it. Uh, B, uh, I want to connect this to Iran, and then I want to connect it to what's going on between Israel and many of the Sunni Arab states. Uh, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Let me start with uh, obviously, Putin, why Putin did what he did. At a certain level, there is no question that his miscalculations were legion and they were a function of his, belief, of his believing his own mythologies. If you go back to last summer, he wrote a 5,000 word treatise in which he explained that Ukraine had never been a separate country. It wasn't real as, 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 a, as a country. He clearly believed that he was dealing with a comedian as a the head of state, he thought there would be an immediate collapse. He would do his own version of shock and awe. Uh, within two or three days, they would take over Ukraine. He would present a fait accompli to the rest of the world. He had no expectation that the United States and Western Europe would sustain their opposition to what he did. Yes, he expected there would be criticism, but he also expected that we would adjust to it. To be fair, there are some reasons why that part of his calculation wasn't so misguided. He was completely misguided in terms of how he thought about Ukraine. But look at the reality, going back to 2008, when he violated Georgia's territorial integrity, when he rejected its sovereignty, when he invaded it, uh, broke all the international norms against changing borders through the use of force, uh, he drew no response, basically no response, not from us during the Bush administration, uh, not from the Europeans. The response was rhetorical, but there was no practical response. When he went into Crimea in 2014, you'll recall, he went in with little green men. I don't mean literally little green men. I mean, he had Russian military, he had Russian soldiers, Russian military going in with no identifying insignia. If you ask yourself the question why, it's because he wasn't sure would there be a real pushback. And if there was going to be a real pushback, he wanted complete deniability if he wanted to back down. But there was no pushback. Uh, there were limited sanctions that were applied that had very minimal effect on the Russian economy. When he goes into Eastern Ukraine, he goes in with Russian soldiers, but he denies it. Later on, he acknowledges and he says, well, it's true, Russian soldiers went there, but they went there on their holiday. Because as we all know, going to war zones during vacation time is a natural thing to do. Again, what's the pushback? Limited. President Obama made the decision that this area mattered more to Putin than it did to us. So he decided we would not provide lethal assistance uh, to Ukraine. Then you had the issue of our not following through on the red line within Syria. Even before that, we did nothing in the face of the, of the Russians intervening in Syria, when the Russians intervened in Syria, again, Putin went in in a stealthy fashion, in a very limited way, again, testing to see what the reaction would be. When there was no reaction, he went in in a more significant fashion. Uh, in, uh, in Syria, both with the Obama administration and then with the Trump administration, agreements were reached with the Russians, none of which were fulfilled. You may not remember this, but in 2017, President Trump met twice with Putin. After each of the meetings, he announced that there were agreements 
with, uh, on Syria. One was, was to create a ceasefire. Later, the second agreement was to create de-escalation zones, neither one of which do the Russians live up to. And in each case, uh, with Trump, just as it was with Obama, there was no consequence. Obviously, we had the chaotic way we withdrew from Afghanistan. All of that tended to confirm in Putin's mind that if he did this, it would produce a very limited blowback. And in any case, if he was going to create a fait accompli within a couple of days, everyone would simply adjust to it. So that contributed to the decision he made. Uh, his own commentary, public commentary yesterday about, you know, the, he doesn't see the negotiations going anywhere, anywhere right now, uh, saying, of course, it's a tragedy, but we were left with no choice. We were threatened by Ukraine. Of course, he wasn't threatened by Ukraine. Uh, what he clearly is looking for even now is some kind of unmistakable military success, which will not be easy to achieve. Uh, the costs already suffered by the Russian military probably exceed the number of dead over all those who were killed during Afghanistan. Uh, sooner or later, this may come back to haunt him within Russia. It won't right now because everything is very strictly under his tight control. He rules out any kind of independent voice. Uh, any dissent is met immediately with arrest. So he can manage for the time being. What he clearly seems to want to achieve right now is not what he originally thought he would, which was basically getting all of Ukraine to submit. Now what he's trying to do is create what amounts to a kind of uh, Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. He's going to try to divide the country. They'll try to take Mariupol so they also deny access to the Black Sea or try to limit it. Uh, he will continue to engage in a kind of scorched earth approach, in part as a kind of punishment to the Ukrainians, in part to try to create a reality where the Ukrainians finally will say, OK, we need to end this war and they'll concede more to him. Uh, what he still doesn't seem to appreciate is the weakness of his own forces uh, and the resolve of the Ukrainians. Uh, so I can't promise this is going to end anytime soon. Uh, I don't see Putin being particularly vulnerable internally at this stage, although, as I said, if we were to meet again, say, a year from now, we might be looking at a different reality within Russia. Uh, the Russians have shown they do react to some. Uh, you may recall, and if you don't, I will call your attention to it. The, the Russians said before the, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA could be reconstituted, the deal could be uh, finalized. Uh, the Russians needed a carve out to exclude Russian Iranian trade from the sanctions. Uh, we and the Europeans said not going to happen. And the, Iranian, the, the Iranians, suddenly the Iranian foreign minister shows up in Moscow uh, and with a message that, hey, we want sanctions relief. You're not in a position to tell us we can't have sanctions relief. Uh, and so suddenly the Russians backed off from, from the Iranian pressure. Uh, now, I raise this partly because it's kind of interesting that there are those to whom the Russians do pay attention. Uh, I would say the Chinese have a lot of leverage on them if they were to exercise it. So far, we haven't seen any sign of it. The Iranians, interestingly enough, have some leverage on them. Uh, and, you know, the whole question of, of Iran and, and the Iranian nuclear deal is one that's worth discussing. So I want to transition to that. This was actually, I would say, a seamless transition, which was so seamless that I'm calling attention to it. Uh, but I want to say something about where we are in terms of the Iranian nuclear deal. It does appear that we're very close to having a deal, but it may be that the Iranians have overplayed their hand. What I mean by that is the Iranians are now insisting that to close the deal, we have to delist the Revolutionary Guard in Iran. Meaning when I say delist, it means the Trump administration put the Revolutionary Guard on the State Department's for, foreign terrorist organization list. There is an argument that when it was done, it was done for purely symbolic reasons, because all the constituent parts of the Revolutionary Guard are designated by the Treasury Department for a series of different reasons, terrorism, money laundering, uh, contrib contribution to nuclear proliferation and the like. So it is true this is done for most, it was done for mostly symbolic reasons. But the Revolutionary Guard is a terrorist organization. The symbolism of taking them off the terrorism list uh, is awful. 
at a time when they are very actively, uh, and even in some cases, overtly uh, engaged in acts of terror, firing rockets, we know two weeks ago and admitting it, that they fired rockets into Northern Iraq. Ostensibly, they said to be attacking an Israeli target. We know they took out uh, the, television, the television station of the Barzani clan. They also uh, destroyed a villa, uh, again, of a, of a leading Kurdish uh, business figure. Uh, it drew some reaction from within Iraq, from Mokad al-Sadr, among others. Uh, and you know, this is what they do as kind of routine. They felt announcing that they had done it would bring no, no consequence. So the idea that you would take them off the, the foreign terrorism list uh, first of all, it makes no sense on its face. And, and secondly, it belies what the Iranians themselves say. They say the Iranian nuclear deal is in one place, it's totally separate from everything else. Well, if it's totally separate from everything else, why are they raising the Revolutionary Guard uh, in this context? Uh, the, the administration at this point seems to be uh, disinclined to delist them. It certainly seems that the president himself is quite against doing so. And the Iranians will have to decide whether or not they want to do this deal or not. I say they're overreaching in part because they are, but also my guess is, and I could be wrong, but my guess is had the Iranians not imposed this condition, or even if they had imposed this condition, but been willing to close before Russia uh, invaded Ukraine, the administration's position might have been different. President Biden clearly does not want to show a sign of weakness at this stage. Delisting uh, the Revolutionary Guard, I think, certainly conveys that kind of a message. So the Iranians will have to decide. They want sanctions relief. If they want it, they're going to have to, to back off that demand. My guess, knowing them, is they won't back off it right now. They will increase the pressure uh, to see if we will give into it. Uh, there are, I will say, pros and cons with regard to doing the getting back into the JCPOA. The main pro relates to where the Iranian nuclear deal, where the Iranian nuclear program is today. To put this in perspective, when the JCPOA was done, the estimate was that it was going to create a one-year period uh, for Iran to be able to have a breakout capability. What breakout capability means is not that they have a nuclear weapon, but they would be able to produce weapons-grade fissionable material. The hardest thing to do if you're going to have a deliverable nuclear weapon is to overcome all the technological problems faced with creating weapons-grade fission material. Uh, what the Iranians have done in the last two years since the last three years, since the Trump administration withdrew from the deal, it's not just that they have violated all the limitations in the deal. It's pretty hard to say they're violating the limitations of the deal that we withdrew from but they are, they blew through all the limitations. Now, the most serious actions they've taken uh, include working through all the technological problems they'd have to overcome to deploy and implement uh, advanced centrifuges. They developed uh, and developed most of their uranium enrichment using primitive first-generation centrifuges. They now have at least five additional advanced models of centrifuges. Uh, they have used their IR6s, which are dramatically more efficient than the first generation, uh, to enrich to 20%. 20% is the dividing line between low enriched uranium and high, highly enriched uranium. They are enriching to 60% now, for which there is no justifiable civilian purpose. 60% is extremely close to weapons grade, which is 90%. It would take them maybe two weeks to go from 60% to 90%. The larger point here is that if you don't roll back the program, the Iranians are probably two to three weeks away from being in a position where they would have weapons grade, physical material, weapons grade enriched to 90%. Without the deal, they could divert that 90% material. They could hide it away. The IAA is not in there in the way it is if you have the deal. So the main pro of this deal is the Iranians have to ship out all the excess material they have, all the excess uh, enriched uranium. They have more than 10 times what they're permitted to have under the terms of the deal. They have to ship out all the 60% that they've enriched. They have to ship out all the 20% that they have enriched. 
So that basically buys you time. Uh, we can debate the actual amount of time. Israelis say it's, it's not as much as the administration says, but the truth is it pretty much would buy you until the year 2030. That's the main pro of doing this deal. The main con is that they get complete, or they get very extensive sanctions relief. And I want you to think about what that means. And this is the reason the Israelis and all the, the Saudis and others in the region are against the deal. Uh, it's not because so much of what it does on the nuclear issue, it's that it, by buying some time on the nuclear issue, it's also relaxing the sanctions, giving the Iranians enormous sanctions relief. Their economy is being squeezed right now, but even though it's being squeezed, bear in mind the reality. The reality is they have been doing a lot in the region, even though they've been squeezed economically. They have been transferring drones uh, to the Houthis, to the militias, the Shia, their proxies in Iraq and in Syria, and obviously Lebanon uh, with Hezbollah. Uh, the drones that they've developed, even though they've been under sanctions, even though they've been squeezed economically, they've developed transport drones, drones that actually can carry and provide material elsewhere. They have surveillance drones and they have drones that are completely armed uh, and, and are weaponized. And this they have been transferring throughout the region. So they've been doing all this even when they've been under sanctions. If you talk to the Israelis or you talk to the Saudis or the Emiratis, they say if they could do all this when they were under sanctions, imagine how much more they can do if the sanctions are lifted. And what that says to me is that if you do this deal, we need a deterrence strategy. We need to raise the cost to the Iranians of what they're doing. We need to work with those in the region in a way that we have not been doing as much as we could to raise the cost to the Iranians. Uh, I'm happy in the Q&A to go through this in great detail. I don't wanna take a lot of time right now but I guess my, my fundamental message here would be, uh, if there is a deal, we need to boost our deterrence strategy. If there isn't a deal, we need to boost our deterrence strategy. Uh, when I say that, Iran has lost their fear of us. And unless we restore that fear, uh, we're gonna face uh, increase, increasing troubles in the region, even if there is a deal. And if there isn't a deal, the, if we don't deter them from going to 90% by making it clear, that's the kind of thing that could trigger the use of hard power against them. Uh, we're gonna face what is uh, a reality in the Middle East that is gonna look a whole lot worse to us, among other things. If they're going to 90%, the odds are going to increase that we're gonna see the Saudis, the Turks, the Egyptians decide that they have to have nuclear weapons as well. By the way, the fact that Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons uh, as part of the Budapest Memorandum in 1994 is sending a message to a lot of countries that if you don't have your nuclear weapons, you're much more vulnerable to kind of threats. Now, when I talk about boosting the deterrence strategy, I'm saying it not only because it's necessary, but I'm also saying there is a whole new opportunity in the Middle East. You know, I could have so far, everything I've been saying probably is, you know, is adding to the impulse that I probably need to provide antidepressants uh, when, I, when I talk about these themes because I don't want to leave you with a sense that there's no hope. When I talk about boosting the deterrence strategy, we have an unusual reality that is emerging in the region. So two weeks ago, uh, it's kind of been lost because of the acts of terror that we've seen in Israel. But two weeks ago, you had the foreign minister of Israel, Yair Lapid, host the foreign minister of Egypt, the foreign minister of Morocco, the foreign minister of Bahrain, the foreign minister of the Emirates, uh, and the secretary of state. Those states, Egypt and Jordan, that had peace with Israel, uh, rarely would leaders, in the case of the Egyptian president, Egyptian presidents don't, don't go to Israel. These were foreign ministers. Foreign ministers might go, but they would go you know, in a low-key way. They would never go with anyone else. Uh, the same with Jordan, although uh, there you had the monarch who was willing to go to Israel. The fact is, Israel was never seen as a venue for Arab states. The idea that Israel would host four Arab foreign ministers and the Secretary of State is a threshold uh, that is an extraordinary one to have crossed. It says, not only is Israel a partner, it says that Israel is seen as a kind of strategic partner and these are countries that wanna be seen as doing business with Israel. Now the convergence of Arab states, Sunni Arab states with Israel began more than a decade ago 
mostly below the radar screen. And it began because of shared strategic threat perceptions, both of Iran, uh, which by the way was a focal point of the discussion in the Negev, but also of the Sunni Islamists, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, and the like. Israel was increasingly seen as a bulwark against these threats. And, uh, and security cooperation became a foundational element of the policies of these Sunni Arab leaderships. What has changed is it's not just based on security any longer. We can talk about the Abraham Accords and what they represent. The most significant thing that they seem to embody is a recognition that there are other challenges that Sunni Arab leaderships know they face. These may not be democracies, but they realize they have to deliver basic services, basic economic needs uh, to their publics. And if they don't, uh, these publics tend to lose their fear. Now, when they think about what they face, they face profound water problems. Why? Because climate change came to the Middle East uh, a long time ago. If you look at the war in Syria, it was triggered by a drought that forced more than a million people off of the farms to cities that couldn't absorb them within Syria. This was what helped to produce uh, what was the uprising and war within Syria. So there are water security problems. There are food related food security problems. The pandemic showed there are health security problems. Cyber is also very clear. These Sunni Arab leaderships look at Israel and what do they see? A cutting edge country and all these technologies. Israel is the one country in the region that literally has solved its water problem. And not because of desalinization, but because it's a leader uh, in drip irrigation technology in the world. It is a leader in terms of having created drought resistant crops. It has, there's an Israeli company now that has been able to grow wheat and rice, two staples that are fundamental to much of the world in terms of, of food intake. They have always been water intensive crops. They've now found a way to grow them uh, with a fraction of the water that's required. Uh, there's an Israeli company called WaterJet that is able to take humidity out of the atmosphere and turn it into drinking water. So there's already a deal between WaterJet and its counterpart in the UAE, not only to sell these units there, but also to market them throughout Africa. So here are a variety of areas where what Israel provides is seen as fundamental to the well being of these Arab states. It's not that they've forgotten about the Palestinian issue, but the Sunni Arab leaderships have come to the conclusion that the Palestinian leadership is incapable of ever acting uh, on ending the conflict. And they're no longer going to deny themselves what they see as being in their national interest. So this gives us something from which to build off of. And I just I want to kind of wrap this up uh, by saying the following. Historically, there was a concept of linkage, and it was that you, you, the Arab states could never end uh, or normalize with Israel unless the Israeli occupation of Palestinians ended. What the UAE did, because they're the ones who created the initiative for the Abraham Accords, came from them, not from the Trump administration. Trump administration took advantage of it, but the initiative came from the UAE in the summer of, of 2020 uh, when they went to the, to the Trump administration and said, look, we'll give you a win in foreign policy. We'll give you the first peace treaty between an Arab state and Israel since 1994, the Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty. But the price is no annexation. You may recall Prime Minister Netanyahu had announced uh, when the Trump, Trump plan was uh, unveiled that he was going to annex the territories allotted to it under the Trump peace plan. In the summer of 2020, the Emirates said, we'll, give, we'll do full normalization, but no annexation. Now think about that. What they were saying is, we're gonna go ahead with normalization, but we need Israel not to take a negative step towards the Palestinians. You can take that as a model. You, know, you could think about the Saudis saying, we'll, do, we'll take a step towards normalization and define a step that Israel could take towards the Palestinians. I'm raising this because the Israeli-Palestinian conflict isn't going away. The acts of terrorism are a reminder that you can't wish the Palestinians away and there's, there still needs to be some resolution for it. Now, the reality is there is no two-state solution anytime soon. Uh, I could go through all the reasons for it, but I'll tell you fundamentally on the Palestinian side, 
there's no capacity to agree to anything. If Meretz was running Israel and they offered everything, you would not get acceptance by the Palestinians. And if you had a Palestinian state tomorrow, it would be a failed state. That's not what anybody wants, including the Palestinians. So the issue is not whether you can produce two states anytime soon. You can't. But you shouldn't take two states off the table. Because when you take two states off the table, it leaves only one state. And Palestinians will increasingly say, if one state's the only outcome, uh, you know, fine, give us the vote, one person, one vote. Now, I raise all this partly so that we don't forget this issue is out there, but I raise it also because the Emirates have created an alternative model that can be used to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. Arab outreach to Israel can be accompanied by certain steps that can be negotiated that the Israelis would take towards Palestinians. You can't produce two states, but you can change the character of the conflict, you can lessen the conflict, you can create the conditions uh, that allow you to produce what isn't possible now to produce it over time. So it's true that I'm kind of a congenital optimist. I couldn't have done what I've done all these years if I wasn't motivated by that. But the reality is there are steps that can be taken. We can build on the Abraham Accords. I think the Biden administration will have to become much more active in terms of actually being willing to broker because these won't happen by themselves. We don't have other Arabs who are prepared to act like the Emirates and to take the initiative, but we have other Arab states that are prepared to act in response to an American effort to broker understandings. So there is a sense of possibility that can be recreated. We should do all we can to promote it. I will stop there. Well, you're not stopping, you're just getting going. Uh, and that really, uh, what you covered uh, in, in, in that last 25 minutes is really quite remarkable. Um, let me start with your antidepressant, um, that picture from Stay Bocare of a foreign minister gathered together, working together. I wanna to take one step back. Um, what, you know, you've worked at this for so long and with so many of these people, in the room, what conditions changed uh, in yeah. the last year? I mean, it's this sort of took a lot of us non-experts by surprise when it happened. And I'm asking both wearing your historian hat, like, you know, what changed from the time that you were working on these things during Oslo, et cetera? And is there anything else we can leverage from those changes uh, to the challenges you, you were speaking to? Sure. Look, you know, Oslo gets criticized by a lot of folks who tend to overlook that without Oslo, you wouldn't be seeing this. What Oslo did, if it was okay for the Palestinians and the PLO to deal directly with Israel, that made it okay for all these Arab states to do so as well. And they began to do so. That's when a lot of this began. Uh, and then it, it developed further over time, especially uh, as the Iranian threat became more pronounced and as we became more questioned. You know, one of the things I hear and I have heard for more than a decade from Arab leaders and Arab officials uh, is that, look, we don't know if the U.S. is going to stay in the region, but we know that Israel can't go anywhere. And increasingly, what Israel was doing quietly with the Egyptians and Jordanians who they had peace with, but they didn't broadcast and still don't broadcast a lot of what's done in the security area. That began to become much more meaningful and much more pronounced. Uh, and as it did so, you began to see much more of the Israelis doing uh, very extensive work with all the countries in the Gulf, uh, more with Morocco. Uh, and so the scope of the security cooperation expanded dramatically over time. And as I said, the more we became somewhat questioned, the more pronounced it became. But was, what was a real turning point uh, were, was really what might be called, you know, I never referred to it as the Arab Spring, I referred to it as the Arab Awakening. What it did for these leaderships, even though there was obviously pushback, you had a war in Syria, a war in Libya, you had a change in leadership twice, you know, in, in Egypt. What it did is it created a sense that if you don't respond more to your publics in terms of their basic economic needs, you know, your public loses its fear. Uh, and the more that became the case, the more there was an openness to doing, uh, looking for increasing ways to, to work with the Israelis. Now, the, obviously, the Israelis were acting on their own in terms of outreach. 
but the, the significant thing is, and I, I want to highlight this about the, the Emirates. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell a story. February of 2009, one month into the Obama administration, I get a call from Yusuf Oteba, who is the Emirati ambassador of the United States, still is. Uh, and he says, you know, at the time, I was still in the State Department before I moved to the White House. And my responsibility was Iran. Uh, and so he calls, he says, look, I'd like to have a conversation uh, about Iran, but I don't want to do it in the State Department. I want an informal, don't want to do it at my, at my embassy. Uh, I have a suite in the Ritz-Carlton downtown. Why don't you come over and we'll have a chat? And so, you know, I was always happy to get out of the State Department. So I go over there, I knock on the door, he opens the door, and who's standing there with him? Salaam Aragorn, <laughs> Israel's ambassador to the United States, February 2009. The meeting was the message. We see the region the same way. We're already cooperating. We want you to see the region the way we see the region. This is 2009. 2015, uh, Abu Dhabi invites <laughs> Israel to establish a diplomatic presence in the International Renewable Energy Agency. Now, technically, it's an international organization, so it's not technically a diplomatic mission to the UAE, but nonetheless, there's a diplomatic presence that's established there. 2017, they begin to invite Israeli athletes to take part in different kinds of competitions. Then Israeli ministers. Uh, Pre-COVID, Israel was gonna be allowed to have a pavilion at Expo 2020 in Dubai. They, of course, did have it when it was allowed, but this was before the Abraham Accords. There were 500 Israeli companies operating in the Gulf prior to the Abraham Accords. So a lot of this was unfolding. People ask me how the Abraham Accords are changing the region. And I say, no, you're missing the point. The region changed. Now, why did it change? It changed in no small part because increasingly Arab leaderships became fed up with the Palestinians. Not the cause of Palestine, but the way Palestinian leadership, first it was divided, Secondly, they saw no indication that it could act on, uh, you know, to end the conflict. Uh, you know, at the time, I presented roughly the Clinton parameters to Bandar, the, the Saudi ambassador to the United States, uh, in December 2000, before we actually presented them, because I wanted Saudi support for them. He told me at the time when I presented it, this is before we presented it to the Israelis and the Palestinians, he said, if, the, if Arafat doesn't accept this, it won't be a mistake, it'll be a crime. Now, that attitude was beginning to percolate over time. Uh, and, you know, he, by the way, after the Abraham Accords, he produced a, Al Arabiya produced a documentary, a three night documentary with him, very high production values, uh, in which he basically recited the history of the conflict and said, we had always supported the Palestinians, we were right to support the Palestinians, but we were wrong to give the Palestinian leadership a pass every time they missed an opportunity. And we can no longer do that. So it doesn't mean the cause of Palestine, the sense of, of an injustice is something that doesn't still resonate, but there is no longer a readiness to sacrifice what these countries believe they need uh, in the hopes that the Palestinians will be able to act to end the conflict. Now, as I said, it doesn't mean there isn't resonance. It doesn't mean that other countries are leaping in to do, to, to cross the thresholds. But what I was suggesting is if we are active, if we actively broker these understandings, we will be able to extend the scope of the Abraham Accords and also deepen it. One last point on this. Since the Abraham Accords, what Egypt is doing with Israel, what Jordan is doing with Israel, is well beyond, in the, in the public domain, in the economic domain, is well beyond what was going on before, in part because it creates additional cover, in part because they don't want to be left behind. So there is something that is changing the region that creates an opportunity there. And as I said, it's not, you can't wish away the Palestinian issue. That still has to be dealt with. But it's also a reminder that it's not the fulcrum around which everything revolves within the region. And as I'm suggesting, you can use Arab state involvement as a way to break the stalemate. You gave us that great little gem there sandwiched in the middle about Iran's uh, leverage with Russia um, and the potential for that um, being something that, that 
um, perhaps could benefit in uh, the, the, the current crisis. Um, we had a question from someone um, in the context of, of doing the Iranian deal. How would, at the moment, trust with both Russia and Iran is at a pretty low uh, uh, place by any um, measure. How, in this context of, of, of this current cri crisis, how would it be possible to essentially prevent Iranian collusion with Russia under a deal? Um, there will be Iranian collusion with Russia. We take that as a given. Uh, but uh, if there is a deal, it's true they're shipping, they ship out the excess material to Russia. Now, all that's monitored. So the, the, the IAE will monitor the shipping out of this material to Russia. Uh, you know, one of the reasons it's Russia is because nobody else wants the nuclear material. Uh, now, if you ask me, is there probably a side deal between the Russians and the Iranians? That if the, if, if there is a, if the next administration comes in and walks away from the deal, will the Russians send back the, the material? My guess is absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true. But, you know, that's also a reason that maybe we shouldn't walk away from the deal. Look, it was a huge mistake for the Trump administration to walk away from the deal. It was not a huge mistake for them to use their leverage and the threat of walking away because they, you could use that with the Europeans at a minimum. The mistake was to walk away and have no plan to replace it. So where we are today, the actual breakout time today that Iran has is you know, probably two to three weeks. That's what it is today. Uh, now, that's not what it would have been if we had not walked away from the deal. You know, the IAE had access. The IAE was able to monitor and say, okay, they're fulfilling the deal. Look, the Iranians fulfill the deal because ultimately it's in their interest. And certainly if there's a reconstituted deal, it's really in their interest because they've changed the baseline of their nuclear program significantly. Uh, they're in a much better position from the standpoint of pursuing a nuclear weapon than they would have been uh, had they not, had we not walked away from the deal. So they're not going to leave the deal between before 2030 because they leave the deal, then sanctions are reimposed. Why should they? They've created a baseline that's much closer. This is a deal that's absolutely in their interest. Uh, the crazy thing is they've overplayed their hand. Uh, you shared your very sobering assessment that the Iranians um, uh, don't have a, a a fear factor toward the United States. We have a couple of questions uh, from um, uh, viewers who are asking about whether that might um, create the kind of void where Israel is gonna feel it needs to take some preemptive uh, act at some point. What's your, your thought on that? Look, Israel has already been acting repeatedly uh, to blunt what the Iranians are doing in Syria. When I say that, I'm focused less on them embedding themselves in Syria. That's not the main preoccupation of the Israelis. It's what the Iranians are doing in terms of trying to put precision guidance on the tens of thousands of rockets that Hezbollah has. And to put that in perspective, Hezbollah has around 140,000 rockets. You know, at least half of them are, are shorter range, but more than half. Uh, have a range and a payload that if you put terminal guidance on them would create a fundamental strategic problem for Israel. I say that because today, the way the Israeli integrated missile defense network works, it's guided by radar. The radar determines whether you intercept a missile that's incoming. The radar determines that if it's gonna hit an open space and not a, not a military, they don't go for military targets so much, but not a, a populated area, you disregard the missile. If you put a terminal guidance on these missiles and they can hit all the civilian areas, they can hit the high value strategic targets economically as well as militarily, Israel has to try to intercept each one. That would swamp, overwhelm the Israeli missile defense network. So they continually carry out strikes to, to blunt this within Syria. There's an article today where the Israelis acknowledge or put out that they've hit 400 targets I think the targets they've hit in Syria are three times that amount. Uh, they call it the war between the wars. Uh, and 
So they have tried to create their own form of blunting what the Iranians are doing. But one indication that they have a kind of deterrence is that, you know, it's interesting that uh, the Israelis last month, the Israelis took out a target in Damascus that killed two, two officers from the Revolutionary Guard. It was a target very much related to what I've been describing, uh, moving the terminal guidance, trying to create local facilities to produce terminal guidance. That's what they, they took. They hit this target and it, it killed two Revolutionary Guard officers. The Iranians said they were going to retaliate. You know who they sought to retaliate against? Not Israel. They hit Al Tanakh, which is where we have a presence. Israeli, Israeli intelligence alerted us to it in advance, and so we were able to evacuate it. They weren't, they chose not to hit an Israeli target, they chose to hit an American target. They were fearful of what the Israelis would do, they weren't fearful of what, of what we would do. They have hit, by my count, you know, over 40, 40 times, including this past week where seven American soldiers were wounded uh, in, in, in Syria. Uh, they have hit more than 40 times bases where US forces were located. We have retaliated twice. Each time we retaliated, we retaliated in a highly calibrated way, sending a signal we really didn't want to escalate. And when you signal, send a signal, I understand why you don't want to escalate, but you don't want to send that signal. Because when you send that signal, you tell the other side, oh, it's okay. They can get away with it. Uh, so we have to reestablish the terms. Now I'll give you one simple way we can do it on the nuclear issue. I have been pushing for this for a long time, uh, so far without success, but I think as the timing may make it more likely it can be done. We should provide the Israelis the massive ordnance penetrator. This was created during the Obama administration. Uh, it was created during the Obama administration because the Iranians have two enrichment sites. One is built into a mountain at Forda. The only way you destroy a mountain is either with a nuclear weapon or we created a non-nuclear device called the Massive Ordnance Penetrator, a 30,000 pound bomb that has a fuse that ignites only deep underground. Uh, Israel does not have a plane that can carry it, so we'd have to lease them the B-2. The minute we do it, we send two kinds of interesting messages. Even if we change our declar declaratory policy, which is what we should do and say to the Iranians, if we see you moving towards a nuclear weapon, which by the way, violates in the preamble of the JCPOA, the Iranians agreed to not to seek, acquire, develop a nuclear weapon. If we see them moving towards that, we should say they are putting at risk their entire nuclear infrastructure. We'll be prepared to act against their entire nuclear infrastructure. They've invested in this you know, tens of billions of dollars over the last three decades. We can destroy it. You know, and they should understand that's what they're, they're running at risk. Now, they don't believe we'll do it. They also don't believe that we will we'll permit the Israelis to attack. Now, two things happen when you provide the Israelis the mob. First, you're allowing them to hit all the targets. Right now, there's one target at Porto they would not be able uh, to destroy. So first, they'd be able to do that. But the second thing is it sends a message. If the Iranians think we're going to constrain the Israelis, we're saying, no, if you, if you provoke that kind of an action because of what you're doing, not only are we providing this to the Israelis, the, the act of providing it to the Israelis sends, will support what the Israelis do. You want to enhance deterrence? This is a really good way to do it. Uh, the uh, lot of questions about allies or uh, in, in, in the region and, and sort of the, the potential for some uh, reconfiguration, uh, Turkey in particular, where, where do you see um, uh, there, there appears to be some warming there with Israel. Um, what, what, what do you see as the potential for, for Tur Turkey to play an increased role in, in with both Russia and Iran? Uh, it is interesting in, in Turkey's case that they are, they are hosting what have been the negotiations, although they seem to be on hold right now, but they also provided very effective drones uh, to the Ukrainians, which in the first two weeks of the war uh, were quite effective. And so they, what's interesting is they were prepared to do that and withstand potential threats uh, from Russia. Because of Turkey's economic situation, which is not good, uh, and which you know, Erdogan is looking to parliamentary elections, 
uh, and he wants to improve the economic situation. We're seeing him improve relations not only with Israel, but with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt. Uh, that gives it a certain greater credibility because he's, he's, Erdogan is adopting a posture that is quite different from what it was with all these countries. With the Saudis, they basically think we're not doing a trial any longer. Uh, with the trial of, of, of those who we think were responsible for Khashoggi's death, you know, that's, that should take place in Saudi Arabia, not in Turkey. Uh, you know, the, the reconciliation with Egypt. They, they broke with Egypt over the issue uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and now with Israel, uh, the outreach, you know, you had the president of Israel go. There's going to be a, a, Erdogan is talking about himself visiting Israel. There are concerns the Israelis have because uh, some of the key, some of some leading Hamas officials base themselves in Turkey. Uh, one of them has been responsible for a lot of the activity in the West Bank. So I think the Israeli position is these people can't stay any longer in Turkey. We'll see what happens. But I, it's significant because, look, strategically, Turkey has always been a profound strategic actor uh, in the Middle East and outside, a member of NATO. Uh, I think if, if there is a way to build on this reconciliation, it serves interests. It also borders Iran. So any strategy against the Iranians also is one that if you have Turkey as a partner in it, becomes more effective. Yeah, I don't know. We've got questions both on Israel's role uh, in the uh, Russian negotiation. Uh, yeah. uh, how much of that do you think is substantive and, and um, um, will it continue, assuming the government continues? We'll get to that one next. Yeah. Um, look, I, if you're a mediator, you have leverage. Israel does not have leverage on Russia. Mm. An intermediary is someone who can, who can talk to both sides and pass messages, who can identify, look, we're hearing this, but you're not really a mediator. You're an intermediary. Can Israel play that role? Yes, it has already. Uh, it helps to explain some of the care with which the prime minister has uh, used in, in talking about uh, Putin, that you'll see the, the foreign minister of Israel doesn't pull any punches. Uh, the prime minister does. Uh, now, there's additional reasons for that. One, you know, the 400,000 Jews who still are in Russia, and there's a sensitivity to them becoming victims of anti-Semitism if, if they stake out, if Israel stakes out too hard line of position against Putin. But the more important strategic reason uh, is, you know, Russia established, as I've, I referred to this at the outset, Russia established a military position in Syria in 2015. One week before the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, Russia ran a joint air exercise with the Syrians, including an airspace not far from Israel's border. This was a non-subtle message to Israel. Uh, Ukraine is very important to us, just like what's happening in Syria is very important to you. Russia has a very significant uh, air defense presence there, S-400 as well as S-300. Uh, and you know the message was, we can make life very difficult for you. We can make it very hard for you to carry out these kinds of operations. Uh, so from an Israeli standpoint, they face a strategic threat with what Iran is doing uh, in Syria and what it's trying to to transfer to, to Hezbollah, uh, and the Russians can make it much harder to deal with that threat. So far, the Russians basically have allowed the Israelis a kind of green light. They don't turn on their air defense radars. Occasionally, they've done it, again, to send a message, but typically, they do not do that. So <laughs> can Israel play a certain kind of role? Yes, but it's limited. Um, it's why it faces a real, a genuine threat um, <coughs> in its northern border. And we've seen them act accordingly. Yeah, a lot of people were, um, uh, I, I don't know, surprise is the right word, but the, the, the fact that, that Israel was brought in was not personality based, and um, um, which leads a, again to the question of uh, which several people have asked about, um, what do you think the implications are for the region, let's say, not Israeli domestic politics, but of the, the current Israeli uh, 
coalition crisis? Um, look, when one thing we know about uh, Israeli politics is that in any coalition, the, the strongest actor in the coalition is not the largest member, it's usually the one who can bring the coalition down. Now we have, a, we have a government that no longer has a majority. Now, because the law requires, if you want to replace the government without an election, it's not just a vote of no confidence that is required. You actually have to have the 61 votes to replace, to have a replacement. Uh, if Bibi Netanyahu had 61 votes, that he could have produced 61 votes, we wouldn't have had four elections. He still can't get to 61. The question is whether or not there is a stake in having a new election. Um, any effort to bring the government down through the Knesset, Knesset doesn't come back in session until May 9th. I don't know that there are a lot of enthusiasts for having new elections. It's pretty clear, it's pretty hard to replace the government without elections. Uh, so we're in a situation where, um, on the one hand, the government will find it very difficult to pass legislation, if not impossible. Uh, on the other hand, and it's a government that has prided itself on getting things done, doing practical things, passing the first budget in three and a half years. Uh, the government will continue to be able to function as a government. It will certainly be able to do foreign policy and national security. It's acting in a decisive way right now to try to blunt uh, acts of terrorism. We've seen a very significant preemptive arrest being made, operations taking place, um, especially in the Jinin area, but not exclusively in the Jinin area. Um, so look, if you ask me, will others in the region continue to be partners with Israel? They're partners with Israel regardless of the government. This partnership began under Netanyahu. This meeting in the Negev took place under this government. This prime minister went to Bahrain. Uh, this prime minister, I'm sorry, this prime minister went to the UAE. Uh, you had the defense minister go to, to Bahrain. Uh, this prime minister went and had a meeting in Egypt with President Sisi and with the, the crown prince of, of the UAE. So the, the scope for involvement in the region is driven by Israel's capabilities and by the credibility that Israel has in terms of acting much more than it speaks about the threats in the region. Uh, and that didn't change regardless of the government. So domestically, there's an implication. Internationally, there's less of an implication. Look, the, the government will be more beholden to those within Yamina. When, when Prime Minister Bennett formed Yamina, uh, it was before you know, the elections that then produced what was going to be no outcome once again, unless he made the decision to, be, to help form a new government. He and, and many of those within a New Hope, which is, again, made up of people who ideologically are probably to the right of Bibi Netanyahu, uh, their view was the institutions of the state were threatened. Israel's democracy as such was threatened. That was more important than the ideological differences they had with other members of the coalition. So, you know, are we at a point where that fundamentally changes? A lot depends upon uh, whether the, this government can entice others to support legislation because it's important to the state. Uh, so far, Netanyahu and Likud are pretty good at blocking anything the government wants to do. That's why you hear people talking about maybe the joint list uh, either provides a safety net or it could, it could vote for some of the legislation. Now, the uh, Ayman Ode uh, hasn't exactly endeared himself to the whole political spectrum in Israel with his statements calling on uh, Israeli Arabs who are in the police to you know, sort of turn in their weapons. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a nonsensical statement to begin with. You know, who suffers most from crime in Israel? Israeli Arabs. Uh, who do you want? Sort of dealing with that? Well, you really don't want Israeli policemen to be dealing with that. Uh, not to mention, you look at who is, is, is really a hero in one of the blunting the 
uh, limiting the scope of who got killed in B'nai Barak was an Israeli Arab policeman who literally sacrificed himself. Um, and so he's, uh, Ayman Oda has, has been attacked. The, the government has made it very clear they're not going to seek the joint list to be part of the government. Joint list also has made it very clear that they're not going to facilitate a Netanyahu-led government. So, you know, there's no, I think, anybody who says they know what's going to happen on this is kidding themselves or kidding you. Well, we, we um, will accept your uh, self-label as an optimist, um, guiding uh, such a long period of uh, critical uh, negotiations for the United States um, uh, to um, give us a little optimism that this is a long game and that there, um, the the work at it um, is is yielding results in ways that we can't always predict and can't always um, anticipate. And so we're we're so grateful for um, your sharing insights on 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 uh, three interrelated. Uh, uh, topics that you masterfully covered uh, today. And we're so grateful. Jeff, some final words just before we sign off from, from you for uh, the session today. Well, just to echo what you've already said, uh, thanks so much for a program, which was to use your word, Wayne, somewhere between sobering and grim on one hand, and also which provided reason for, uh, for those who are engaged with the league to keep fighting uh, as those who are engaged with the league are already disposed to do. I'm grateful to the League uh, for its excellent work, grateful to Ambassador Ross for once again demonstrating why he is an exemplar in so many respects. Suffice it to say that uh, Saul Ewing was very, very pleased to collaborate in this program and will be very pleased to collaborate with the League uh, in the future. So thanks for uh, including us in the program. Well, if today's program brought anybody uh, a little bit closer to Israel, we know that uh, many people are now actually beginning to travel uh, to, to Israel again, which, for which we're very grateful. Um, not everyone has the ability to jump on a plane. So if you can't go and you're looking for something interesting uh, to do uh, uh, during Passover week, during Easter week, uh, during Ramadan, hey, We've got a virtual visit to Zikron Yaakov coming next week with our master tour guide, Ruben. So come back and join us next Wednesday on the 20th. Indeed, we run these programs weekly and we're grateful to have everyone here. So thanks for everyone for participating today. We appreciate your support. You know, we don't charge for this. We want as many people to come. Please share. We will provide a, a free uh, video copy. Many of you have asked it, about it in the link. We'll share it with you, share it with your friends, let people know. We want to wish everyone Pesach Sameach, Ramadan Mubarak, Happy Easter. Be safe. Greetings. Thank you.